Hi, I'm Dr. Martin Rutherford. I am a certified functional medicine practitioner. I am also a chiropractor since 1979. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist as well as being a chiropractor. And those are two separate disciplines that we've kind of squashed together. Uh, in our clinic, we, we combine our, our disciplines in our histories and, our, and in our examination procedures. Uh, and, and we utilize those procedures to um, inadvertently develop an autoimmune practice. Uh, autoimmune um, neurological diseases, chronic syndromes, chronic pain, uh, everything that falls into that category uh, kind of comes into our practice these days. And because of those two disciplines being put together, um, we get a pretty good consistent result because of the way that we screen our patients and evaluate our patients and ultimately determine whether they're good candidates and expose them to maybe some of the things we're gonna talk about with you today. Um, we became involved with autoimmune diseases. I, I don't know, did, did you wanna do this? Uh, no, we became involved with um, autoimmune and neurological diseases years ago. Um, Essentially, I got sick. For those of you who watch every week, every time we talk about something, I say, yeah, I got that too. <laughs> and it's true. I have all that stuff. Um, I, I investigated, uh, like many of the patients coming in here, I investigated many different... Uh, I don't have rheumatoid arthritis. I know. I was going <laughs> to interject <laughs> I that. I don't have rheumatoid arthritis. But uh, just about everything else we've talked about in the last two years. Um, Anyway, I got, uh, I got very sick, stressed, sick, pneumonia. Next thing I know, I had fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, peripheral neuropathy. Uh, it ended up I had celiac, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, and we quit looking about that point. <laughs> Multiple concussions, stress mechanisms, just the whole thing that all of our patients walk in here with. And we kind of started off with fibromyalgia. And we started off with fibromyalgia and, and started to figure that out and then we started to see that a lot of fibromyalgia patients have peripheral neuropathy. Um, and then we started seeing all of those people were chronically fatigued. And then we started seeing the half of the peripheral neuropathy patient had restless leg syndrome. Dr. Gates then showed up one day and uh, saw what we were doing. Uh, he walked in on a lecture I was doing on dizziness, vertigo. It was balance. peripheral neuropathy. It was mm -hmm. peripheral neuropathy, one of, one of our lectures. <laughs> and he joined uh, staff and, and, uh, and, and, Dr. Gates is a functional neurologist, kind of cut his teeth on dizziness, vertigo, balance, mm -hmm. migraines, mm -hmm. yeah. those things. And uh, as we started to piece this together, um, it evolved into understanding that most of our patients who had these conditions, who, for whom they were not going away, balance problems, migraine problems, things of that nature, had a few things in common. Um, they had they, they generally seem to have autoimmune conditions of some type, uh, many times less obvious than rheumatoid arthritis. And they uh, seem to have a lot of neurological components. Many times the neurological component was a post-traumatic stress syndrome type of stress mechanism going on. But we also treat now dizziness, vertigo, balance, restless leg syndrome. We do post-stroke. We've seen Parkinson's patients. Um, my God, uh, you could probably go on with all the ones we've yeah. seen. So that's kind of how our clinic came to be. And we started out um, trialing some of these uh, with different things uh, that we learned from our mentors, uh, individual mentors and teachers. And over a period of time, we've managed to put together a paradigm or in a logarithm for chronic pain. It's an organized way of going about chronic pain to look at all of the potential parts uh, that would be contributing to that person's specific uh, pain syndrome. We were just talking Saturday morning. We meet every Saturday morning uh, and talk about things around the office and, and cases and stuff. And we were just saying, do, do, we, do you feel that we kind of have our paradigm intact? And is it something that is it something that's probably going to expand? And the answer was no. We think we have a pretty good idea of of what's going on with chronic pain, autoimmune problems, uh, many neurological problems. Uh, certainly, things can always be refined and tweaked, and we continue to do that. He continues to do that because Dr. Gates is doing most of the treatment. Well, he's doing all the new treatment now. 
Um, uh, he continues to seemingly tweak it on a daily basis because I have to try to keep up with it. So that's who we are. Um, that's the overview of our clinic and how we came to be involved with neurological problems and autoimmune <clears throat> problems. I think the important thing, you know, is I don't know, I was doing a lot of reading last night and I was just reading an article this morning, two articles on gluten sensitivity and whether it's uh, legitimate or not. And it seems like everybody who writes these articles has never treated a patient. <laughs> and, and, and as Dr. Gates heard me say when he first came in there, the key is, is really to get in there and treat patients and observe clinical changes. Because when you see, when we see a lot of patients, okay, and when, and when you see the numbers of patients that we see, you are involved in an ongoing clinical trial. And since we're not doing anything that's gonna hurt anybody, we can experiment a lot and we can see what's happening, what's not happening. And as, and as we said in the beginning, when we were first talking, I said, you'll see trends years before it starts coming out in the, um, in the literature and certainly, I think that has, I would, I would say, I think that has been the case based on the smile on your face. And so we're gonna share with you some of the trends we've seen relative to rheumatoid arthritis. Now I'm gonna talk just a little bit more mm -hmm. and say, most people don't come to us with rheumatoid arthritis. Mm -hmm. Most, we've treated a lot of rheumatoid arthritis, but most people come to us with something else. Yeah, neuropathy, fibromyalgia, problems, fibromyalgia overlay on it, yes. Absolutely. And then they happen to have rheumatoid arthritis. Or thyroid. Thyroid or gut right. <laughs> or irritable bowel right. syndrome. Yeah. We're, we're going to talk about all this. And, and, they, and then I'm look, sitting there doing the intake. I do an interview to, on patients to determine whether they would be a good candidate for our program. And I'll be sitting there and I'll see their hands and they'll be red and they'll have the, the, the lesions and their hands will be going this way. And I'll say, well, you have rheumatoid arthritis. Is that something you're interested in doing? Oh, nothing going to be done for that. Are, I've already taken the drugs and so on and so forth. And, and, and again, a lot depends on the stage that the person's in and so on and so forth. And, and we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about, so, so we've seen a lot of rheumatoid arthritis and in treating the other conditions in general, the rheumatoid arthritis would improve. Um, I think depending on the stage, it may stop. Um, and, and, which, and which most articles that I've read on rheumatoid arthritis over the past year say that can't be done. Um, so we're going to talk about all of that. So that's our experience. We're going to, we're going to share our experience with you. We're going to share what we've seen. We're more than willing to share the good and the bad of what we see in, in, you know, what works and what doesn't work. So rheumatoid arthritis, what, what is it? Let's do an overview of rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is a condition, as many of you know, or experience such that you have symmetrical pain, uh, largely morning stiffness that's associated with the distal joints as we term them. So it may involve the metacarpophalangeal joints that what we term these joints right here, which are the pips, I don't say proximal interphalangeal joints, not to be too specific, but then also the wrists, the feet, the knees, the upper cervical spine. Those are the primary areas involved with rheumatoid arthritis as Dr. Rutherford just laughs hysterically internally <laughs> as I'm always trying to avoid the technical data, you know, at too technical of a level because this, these uh, broadcasts go out to a lay audience, but sometimes I just can't resist. So that's rheumatoid arthritis. Again, largely there's morning stiffness that will improve as the day goes on. Rheumatoid arthritis can be diagnosed from a number of, of variables, largely a clinical history and examination is something that needs to be done first. Uh, radiographic tools like x-rays can be very helpful looking at the hands and then also other means such as blood tests can give us an accurate diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. And, and I think that the testing warrants a little bit more discussion because people are confused. I, I, I must say one of the strangest cases I've ever had was a patient who came in here for rheumatoid arthritis. I know who you're talking about, yeah. Who, whose hands were pretty obvious that this lady had rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, there, there was damage clearly when Dr. Gates says clinically, you diagnose this clinically, it means there's not a lot of good testing for it other than looking at it and feeling it and then understanding the condition versus other conditions. This, this woman had a significant increase in her joints. Um, her hands were, ex were uh, ulnar deviated. Ulnar deviated, thank you, deviating to the outside like this. She, she was literally like this, her mm -hmm. hands were like this. And I said, so you rheumatoid arthritis? And she said, well, my doctors aren't sure. And I was like, 
because, well, the tests, the tests were inconsistent. So I, I, I've heard that a That's lot. That's a great point. It's a great we, point. I think it's something to. So with autoimmune about. disease and in today's medical climate, doctors are being trained and really forced by the insurance industry to rely on tests. They want to eliminate doctor's time with patients. By they, I'm referring to third-party payers and the insurance companies because they don't want to have to pay a doctor for a longer period than they have to. So doctors are forced to use the blood tests, which in autoimmune disease are oftentimes inaccurate, unreliable, unspecific, unsensitive. And they stink. <laughs> <laughs> and they vary from individual to individual and day to day. Therefore, you may go in and have a rheumatology profile that, gosh, we get lab testing at a cheap rate. And for us, some of these profiles can be upwards of $500, which means your insurance company may be charged around $3,000 for one of these profiles. And it may not be accurate for that day or any given day, and you have to keep repeating it. Well, that's quite a cost. But anyways, as Dr. Rutherford is alluding to with this case, she went to her rheumatologist, the tests were normal, so he didn't want to make a diagnosis, probably because he didn't have enough time to really do a clinical history with her and look at, what she had actually going on. So it is really important to take the time to look at a, any individual who is suspected of having an autoimmune condition, especially one like rheumatoid arthritis. And I think we pretty well hit the overview on it. We could go into details and nuances of how rheumatoid arthritis patients present and their lab testing. No, I think that was just a, yeah, that's exactly. a consistent confusion out there, especially mm -hmm. for the person who is just beginning to get it, they're red, it's tender, you take the x-rays, you see a little bit of erosion, but the RF factor is negative, and right. the doctors as well, yeah. yeah, or the CCP antibiotics are negative, and they tell them that they don't have it. I just made a note, I think we ought to do a talk on, I think we ought to do one day on uh, diagnosis then versus diagnosis now. Okay. And, and, and really, really give people uh, an idea of how um, tenuous many of their diagnoses are, but we don't want to get into all that right now. Um, but I think that would be a good subject because this is when I see it in the most. I mean, it's insane. People come in with clear clinical diagnosis, clear rheumatoid arthritis, and they've been told, well, we don't know if you have it or not. So anyway, so if you have it and it's swollen and it's tender and you're, and, and, and it, it, you're getting into a joint and, and even, and, and there's x-ray evidence of it, you probably have it. So current medical therapies, and they're, and they're largely drug therapies. And I read this morning, I, I did a little, do a little brief checking, and it said alternative therapies have, are not, are not uh, uh, supported by any medical evidence. So I just thought I'd throw that one at you before we, we get oh to that gosh. later on. So current, and that was, uh, that was on med, was it? Uh, what, what were they referring to, like Medline? Medline? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Were they referring to one specific disease no, or that's just all in general? Said. That's all they said. So, well, we can, so we can, well, I just think it's important for I'm people. I'm glad you brought it up to and know we're going to accentuate that today. So we'll talk about the medical therapies first. The medical therapies for rheumatoid arthritis include the disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs called the DMARDs. These are drugs like methotrexate. If you have rheumatoid arthritis, you've probably been on that. And it's used to basically calm down the immune system so your immune system stops attacking the joints in the hands, in the feet, in the knees. In essence, I don't think we've really mentioned it, rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease. So your immune system is killing you in a specific pattern, namely these joints that we outlined before. Now the new frontier in rheumatoid arthritis is the biologic drugs. So these are drugs like Humira, Simsia, Actimera. These are um, expensive medications to say the least. And there's a lot of discussion about them over the next decade. I talked about this last week. They're forecasted to run about $1 trillion in cost for our healthcare system. Just this class of medication, $1 trillion. And they're used in conditions, especially like rheumatoid arthritis, other conditions like psoriasis, Crohn's disease, but also cancer. And I think because of the cost of the biologic medications. Now we're talking about the biosimilar medications, which are forecasted to save us $50 billion out of that $1 trillion over the next decade. Well, I got news for you. That still is unsustainable, that $950 billion increase in costs for our healthcare system. And that's really the impetus why we're doing this series over the last three weeks. And we'll continue doing it until we exhaust all the autoimmune diseases we want to talk about, such that new 
therapies need to be engineered to help autoimmune disease patients that are not as expensive, in our opinion. And we're doing it. And we're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just to add to that, the, the, the position on those medications is they will not stop the progression. Right. The position in the medical community at, the, at this point, now this doesn't mean your medical doctor thinks this, although they probably think this, but is that the, the, is that the progression cannot be stopped that these drugs will not stop the progression, if I'm correct, I, uh, and, and that it'll, it'll reduce the inflammation and calm the immune system, but it might slow down the progression and it'll help you to uh, uh, handle it better because it will decrease inflammation. But it doesn't always because that's why we get people in our office. Right, exactly. Because they're taking these drugs and it's, and it's not working. And, and these are some heavy duty drugs that are, are uh, something that you, you know, you take a lifetime, you pay, there, there's a trade-off uh, for, for taking these. And things. I'll be specific on that point because this is a hot area it with is. a lot of money at stake. So Big to speak. Um, like with Crohn's, we talked about last week. In essence, a lot of the biologic medications that are used for Crohn's work for about a year and then their efficacy falls off after that. And then after that year time period, a lot of times uh, the individual will start making immune cells to the medication that can decrease its effectiveness. So relative to rheumatoid arthritis, there's a lot of rheumatoid arthritis patients out there who report that they get great results with Humira and Actimera and things of that nature, drugs of that nature. And so we'll, we'll say that they can help, but they don't always help because we see a lot of patients who come in here who have been on those medications and they're just not producing the same results that they once did. Right, right. And as of this morning, Redline says, and alternatives, <laughs> Offer no, uh, no, no help, uh, and are unsubstantiated. So, and people consider us alternative. Okay, mm -hmm. I mean they just do. I, I don't think we're alternative because we do work in an integrated fashion. Many cases, we uh, will work with uh, an osteopath or two that we've worked with for years. Um, we might work with a cardiologist. We might work with a neurologist, an internist, whatever. Um, I, I think the approach for autoimmune and neurologic diseases has to be an integrated approach. I don't think you can get dogmatic and say all medicine bad, all alternative good, et cetera, et cetera. And it's just kind of odd because we kind of run the programs here and we're not the medical doctors. We're, we're chiropractors. We have a postgraduate, significant postgraduate education in functional medicine. I know I'm also a certified in, in, in spinal trauma. Dr. Gates is a, is a board certified functional neurologist, chiropractic, which, neurologist, chiropractic yeah. neurologist, which which is a much stronger, frankly, at this point, certification than uh, than functional medicine because they have a board. I mean, I mean, there's a lot of education that's gone into this. But as I said in the beginning, we've treated thousands of patients also. And interestingly enough, even though Medline says alternative uh, shows no efficacy, the reason we've been able to do what we've been able to do is because what we do doesn't hurt anybody. And so we can try different things and it either works or it doesn't work. It might cause a side effect for a day or two. And then, and then that's it because we don't use, um, we don't use drugs first. Mm -hmm. Right. If right. we use, if we go, if we integrate the, the medical community at all, it's usually once we realize that we're gonna that that's necessary and that's usually after we've tried a number of the alternative uh, <laughs> methods so why don't we um, i kind of a little bit describe functional medicine integrative medicine but once you take that a little bit further relative to our approach relative to disease and other and, and, okay and neurological problems and with everything we're saying we're not saying that we're anti uh as you're saying, we're not anti-pharmaceutical, <laughs> but we're not anti the biologics. No. These are good drugs. They help people all the time. But again, they're costly. So we're trying to figure out what else can we do to help an individual with rheumatoid arthritis or some other autoimmune disease. They're I just want to drugs. clarify that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we said, that they, we said that they didn't stop the progression. I think they do slow down the progression. I'll I'm say just that telling part. you what Medline says. Okay. I'm they said that. it does not stop. They the said the biologics does, do not stop the progression. They absolutely said it. Wow. Actually, okay. they said they're questionable still. Huh. As okay. of this morning. All right. Well, <laughs> thank you for being pedantic. Just now I can <laughs> relax for the rest of the broadcast. <laughs>
<laughs> oh goodness! I'll even show it to you when we're done. Yeah, and I won't bring up the conversation. We He's the researcher. The... Every time I throw some research in, it really screws him up. <laughs> <laughs> Just because I'm racking my brain. Okay, we're, what study was that in? <laughs> okay, can, can we proceed from here? So, functional medicine, the integrated medical approach to handling autoimmune diseases. There was a book that came out called Integrative Rheumatology. It was written by two medical rheumatologists. In that book, they detailed how, in their experience treating rheumatology patients, they really didn't get that good of results. And so they said, we need to start to integrate other therapies like acupuncture, nutrition, adjustments, manipulation from osteopaths into the treatment of someone with rheumatic illness because what we're doing currently is not working. I won't say that that book is really caught like wildfire <laughs> in the medical community. And then there was another gentleman who published a book by the same name called Integrative Rheumatology. His name is Dr. Vasquez. He's one of our mentors. Uh, we greatly admire this gentleman for his work that he's done. And he really discussed the underlying causes of these rheumatologic illnesses, namely being dietary issues as well as infectious triggers. So we're finding, or we have to ask the question, why is your immune system killing you? And why is this becoming so much more common? One out of six Americans now have an autoimmune disease and it seems to just be escalating across all autoimmune diseases. The prevalences are rising. And from that, we start looking at, okay, is it the vaccines going up in number? Is it the fact that we take so many antibiotics? Is it the food supply? Is it a confluence of factors? Is it the fact that we don't grow up with parasites? We don't really know for sure, but we just know they're going up. And out of this, the data is becoming pretty clear that certain infections in the body are triggering certain autoimmune diseases, as well as the fact that diet seems to play a role with some autoimmune diseases. Now, the data st is still early with certain uh, conditions, but it's not early and it's pretty well established in other conditions. So from that, we can say the functional medicine and integrated approach is to not just say, oh, you have rheumatoid arthritis, you should take this supplement as an example. You should take curcumin or you should take grapeseed oil, but rather it's to get to the underlying cause of the problem, which as I just outlined is lots of times dietary or an infectious trigger. Right. And these infectious triggers are things that we see all the time. Yes, we in, do. In our, and, and, and again, this has been an evolution of our understanding. Of, uh, are you going to talk about Epstein-Barr virus eventually? or are you? I wasn't today, to but we can. I mean, just for, and the reason why I wanted to talk about that was there, there's, there's data out there, maybe Epstein-Barr virus or HHV-6 virus can be causing rheumatoid arthritis. The reason I mentioned Epstein-Barr virus is because we're right down the road. We're in Reno, Nevada. Mm -hmm. We're in this beautiful little valley. And on one side of the valley is the Sierra Nevadas, beautiful mountains. And up on the Sierra Nevadas is a beautiful lake called Lake Tahoe. And there's a doctor up there who in the 80s decided Epstein-Barr virus was the cause of chronic fatigue syndrome. And, and he, he had people coming from all over the world doing all kinds of medications and things of that nature. It didn't actually work out very well. And I could tell we share some patients. I can tell he's changed his, mm -hmm. his position on that. But, but, we have, but because of that, we've seen a lot of Epstein. We, you know, we've, we've looked at Epstein-Barr virus in a lot of our cases where people have chronic fatigue. Mm -hmm. And the interesting part is, in retrospect, now that you think about it, we start seeing, we look we do, we have, we have, we have kind of a, I don't, I don't want to say a specific way of, of um, testing. Our testing comes from our uh, histories and from our examinations. But Dr. Gates has done a lot of investigation into specific testing so that we can do the least testing possible and get the most amount of data. Exactly. And so we've been doing Epstein-Barr viruses and cytomegaloviruses forever, and they show up all the time. And it turns out, that that they're really not involved with um, chronic fatigue all the time, but they are involved some of the time. some of the time. And these are things that you know that you see from observing day in and day out and day in and day out. And in the end, um, we see Epstein Barr virus in a lot of these mm -hmm. in a lot of these cases. And we're talking about recurrent infections with Epstein Barr where it's active. We're testing the active form of it. We know all of you have been exposed to Epstein-Barr, but these are chronic infections that are rearing their ugly head. So Epstein-Barr virus, and Dr. Gates is going to talk about a couple of other things here, are being considered as the cause of rheumatoid arthritis. And we, in, in, in a few weeks ago, we mentioned, Dr. Gates mentioned, 
relative to some intestinal viruses. And that's, I think, what we're going to talk about today. And we live and die in the intestines, as I had to tell one lady yesterday who <laughs> was a little doubtful that her problem was going to start in her intestines. Mm -hmm. She was absolutely certain of it. And I had to politely say, you came here for my opinion, not your opinion. You're not. She's sick. She's been like 26 doctors and, and they've tried everything. And, and without question, the problem, her problem is starting in her intestines. We've seen her problem like a million times, it seems like. What's interesting that, that I think we're going to find out everything starts in the gut eventually. And we can mm -hmm. get back into that mm -hmm. again at some point. But let's talk about, now you want to talk further about the approach or you want to, you want to go straight to the... I'm ready to go into Proteus. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's do Proteus for those of you who want to know. What maybe causes rheumatoid arthritis? So it's so interesting what you just said this morning about that article on Medline where they say these alternative therapies have no credence whatsoever. And I, in researching for this broadcast, I went through all of Dr. Ebringer's data. He's out of the United Kingdom, King's College, kind of a big deal over there. And he has pretty much dedicated his entire life to figuring out the cause of rheumatoid arthritis. And it has fallen on deaf ears. <laughs> <laughs> he has hit the gold mine and no one is using it. And it's very, very interesting. Possibly, you know, we can only conjecture why maybe the financial motives in terms of you're not going to make a lot of money on antibiotics for this. Uh, but really, he has basically traced it out just like someone early in time traced out, you know, how um, tuberculosis, that bacteria causes tuberculosis or how infections were transmitted. Such that with rheumatoid arthritis, there's this bacteria called Proteus mirab mirabilis. Proteus mirabilis, so I'll repeat it again. And it's a bacteria found in our gut, and it's also found in the urinary tract of rheumatoid arthritis patients. Now, you will probably remember from other broadcasts we've done, we've talked about other bacteria throughout the body that have been associated with rheumatoid arthritis. Namely, there's one in the mouth called Porphyromonas gingivalis. There's another one in the gastrointestinal tract under the heading of Prevotella species. And these two bacteria, Porphyromonas and Prevotella, have been shown to be found in the joints of rheumatoid arthritis patients. And they've also been shown to elicit the specific immune reaction seen with rheumatoid arthritis patients that, as Dr. Rutherford said, lead to the big joints, the swollen joints, the stiffness. Well, Dr. Ebringer has taken it one step farther, and his data is really far more convincing. He has amassed basically 40 years of research on this issue. And he has shown that there is, obviously we know there's a genetic component to rheumatoid arthritis. So you have to have certain genes in the certain environment to develop it. He's shown that the genetic immune component with rheumatoid arthritis matches from a molecular standpoint, how this bacteria looks. So we've referred to it in other broadcasts as molecular mimicry. So this bacteria looks exactly like the genetic immune cells that you have if you have rheumatoid arthritis. Um, they, they're kind of like a lock and key mechanism. And he has shown that if you put um, these, this, these genetic immune cells into a mouse, that that mouse can start to attack this bacteria. He's then gone on and shown that basically all rheumatoid arthritis patients or the majority have this Proteus mirabilis in their gut. He also has been able to culture it from the urinary tract of rheumatoid arthritis patients from 16 different countries across several continents. He has then shown that um, you can get rid of this bacteria and that can improve symptoms. He's shown that uh, diet can play a role and I'll get into all of that a little later on. So I just want to highlight this, that the data is there. I attached 22 articles to today's broadcast. There are even more out there discussing this relationship but it's it's definitive i'm not going to use any other adjectives in there. we'll have to send these to medline maybe they haven't seen them yet yeah maybe they <laughs> haven't done this research <laughs> so so we got a so we got a bacteria so we got a bacterial origin and um and and as you mentioned maybe they're not going to make a ton of money on antibiotics for this. so antibiotics so antibiotics are one approach. of the yes antibiotics have been proposed for Proteus mirabilis and they've done cultured sensitivities where basically this bacteria, they have somebody urinate out, they take a specimen, they take the urine, they put it on a plate, they grow this bacteria, and then they put antibiotics on the plate and they see which ones work. And certain antibiotics have been shown to be effective. Now, in Dr. Ebringer's work, he also discusses hydration as being a key factor for decreasing Proteus mirabilis 
uh, quantities in the urinary tract. He discusses cranberry juice, which is kind of an alternative thing, as being effective for urinary for tract infections. For urinary tract infections. <laughs> He's discussed uh, certain types of dietary therapies that we're going to get into next. But yes, antibiotics are discussed in this context, and we work in an integrated fashion. So we work with patients from a dietary aspect, from an immune aspect, from healing the leaky gut aspect to calming the immune system down naturally as best as we can. And then we look and see where a patient is at. If a patient is doing well at that point, then Yahoo. But if they're not quite where we need them to be, uh, we may refer them for an integrated approach. And I did that in a recent case with a gal who had rheumatoid arthritis, referred her back to her medical doctor, showed him this data. He put her on an antibiotic for this urinary tract infection. And all of a sudden, her left it's ankle right. pain associated with rheumatoid better. arthritis went away. Right. And it's been away. And it's pretty dang cool stuff. Yeah. Reflecting exactly what Dr. Uh, Ebringer, Ebringer yeah, said. Exactly. Exactly. So, again, this is the power of clinical practice. And, and people can argue, oh, we're, there's an article we're sitting right here on, uh, on gluten and, and whether it's real or not. And there's two books, and one of them argues it's uh, totally. Uh, uh, it's called the gluten lie. The gluten lie. <laughs> it's totally a lie. And then all of our patients who do things like this. I had a patient who came in last week, and before they even. So we do a, a, a consult first, and we determine she would be a good candidate for us. And we talked about food sensitivities possibly being part of her problem with her joint problems. So she went home and took stopped eating gluten and a bunch of other things, mm -hmm. and she came back. Her knee pains, which they were going to do surgery on, were gone. The knee pains were gone. She still had other stuff, and she kind of got that she needed to still kind of follow through what we're doing. But she was, like, blown away that, um, that uh, uh, food, I mean, she went on and on. I'm so blown away that food can make a difference in food, and, and so on and so forth. So, um, so that's kind of what you're dealing with here. That's what you're dealing with. We, here you have somebody, they take antibiotics for a urinary tract infection, the rheumatoid arthritis in their ankle goes away. Okay, you, you can't fake that. That's not fake. That's not psychosomatic. Mm -hmm. what is, that's not the placebo yeah, effect. Exactly. It's not anything like that. So we talk from experience. And we don't know the, the percentage of times that's going to happen. But we've seen a lot of rheumatoid arthritis patients, and they've all done well, mm -hmm. I would say. I mean, if, yeah, I have one tough one going right now, but overall, say, they've all done well. I was yes. just going to say, you know, so and we're we're only, but we're not done with that one yet. Exactly. And maybe they won't get better. Okay, it's it, but we don't have too many failures in that area. Mm -hmm. So vegetarian diets and rheumatoid arthritis. So I'm working with a patient right now. Let's just say she's a professional, and she's lost 30 pounds. All of her lab tests in terms of inflammation, rheumatoid arthritis factors have gone down. And she talked to a rheumatologist and he said, you know, there's just no information regarding diet and regarding diet improving rheumatoid arthritis. And I just scratched my head because this morning we went through all these articles and I didn't attach everything I could have regarding dietary therapies for rheumatoid arthritis being shown to be really effective. I'm not trying to knock that rheumatologist. I'm just saying lots of times, and this is discussed, medical doctors are trained in medication approaches, surgical approaches. Dietary therapies are not necessarily at the forefront of their thought processes most of the time. So out of this, vegetarian diets and all right. Uh, the studies were done in the 1990s, pretty convincing. They followed this group of patients for quite some time where they put them on a fast. So one group basically just ate a regular diet. The other group got put on a fast for 10 days. I think it was a juice fast. And then they went on to a gluten-free, mind you, dairy-free, vegetarian-based diet. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> because basically a vegetable-based diet lacks uh, some of the molecular mimicry components of the Proteus mirabilis bacteria. So that was the line of thinking. Okay. So they put them on the vegetarian diet. And overall, most of these patients got considerably better. In fact, most of their blood lab tests got better, kind of like I outlined with that patient. And it was convincing. It was over a period of two years that they saw these patients were better from this vegetarian, gluten-free, dairy-free based diet. And they did many follow-up studies. And they also went back in and looked at the antibodies to Proteus mirabilis in these patients. Before and after treatment, they found that those who are on the diet, their antibodies to Proteus mirabilis went down significantly. 
because the thought process is, is that the vegetarian based diet is very good for the gut bacteria, the good gut bacteria. It's called the microbiome. And by feeding the good bacteria, the bad bacteria or pathogenic bacteria like Proteus mirabilis couldn't grow anymore. And therefore it basically cured the problem yeah. without the use of antibiotics. But that took a period of time that took 10 months to two years. So very, very interesting data. Those articles are attached. If you need more articles on the subject, I'll dig them up for you. But it's pretty conclusive. And so from that, it's almost laughable, that article that you outlined this morning, that there's no research for natural therapies in these diseases, because there's tons of research. And the fact that this guy in this book is, or this person, <laughs> the gluten lie, a religion expert argues that myth and superstition, not science, are what's feeling the explosive gluten-free fat. That's from Time Magazine, June 15th. Dr. Rutherford brought it in today. Yeah. Um, the science is there, and I think it has a lot of people kind of afraid, and that's why you're seeing a backlash regarding it. So we've talked about the two most egregious dietary uh, uh, habits that, that a human being can walk into a restaurant with, <laughs> being gluten-free and being a vegetarian. And you get attacked. I was having this conversation the other night with uh, someone who has celiac and who's very good at staying off of it and, and her boyfriend. And they said, you know, you feel like you go into a restaurant and everybody looks at you like you're weird. And if you're vegetarian, people look at you like you're strange. You know, we went to a, uh, we went to a conference on diets and nutrition and chronic inflammation and, and uh, about a year ago, September. And it was a 36 hour um, seminar that went quite longer than that. And the vast majority of that um, seminar was, was 19 presenters from, I don't know how many different countries from around the world, probably 19 different countries uh, or close to that. And um, all talking about how fruits and vegetables and, are, are helpful, uh, the, the addressing the grain situation um, they mentioned very little about meats, although they had the paleo diet mm -hmm. uh, gentleman. Um, Lauren Cordain. Was Lauren there. Cordain was there and giving a very nice talk. Um, we don't tell our, we're both vegetarians, full, full uh, conclusion. You can't, you can't do this work and look at all this stuff and not go home and look at things and go, you know, man, I, this is something I should probably do. No, we don't tell our patients that they have to be vegetarians. Mm -hmm. right. Excuse me, but doctor... Gates will share this recommendation with these specific types of patients, so that, that can, patient can make a, a you know informed uh, decision as to whether they want to do what the science says. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they want to do what has shown to work clinically for us. Person goes on, you know, person goes on this, and the next thing, you know, their ankle goes away, and, and, and so or the that was the antibiotic. Mm -hmm. All right, but still. The, the, so the vegetarian diet does a lot more than, than, than just what they postulated relative to there. It's anti-inflammatory. It's anti, it's, it's generally anti, um, uh, antigens. It, it reduces mm -hmm. a lot of the types of things. And frankly, most of the research on meat shows that it's eating meat for the colon is about like smoking for the lungs, <laughs> just throwing that in there, just saying, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, so just the share that position with you. There is clinical significance to a vegetarian diet in, a, in some of the things that we do. We don't have to take everybody off of vegetable or off of meat for them to get better. In fact, we take very few people off mm -hmm. meat, actually. Um, but our rheumatoid arthritis patients more and more, I'm taking them off. I don't start them that way, but I- Right, and educate them. It's not going in the right direction, we do that. So just saying, that's what we see. It seems to work. It's not a drug. The long-term effects are usually that if you would eat that way, um, you would probably feel better in a lot of different ways. Uh, not just, because usually rheumatoid arthritis does not, uh, is not present in isolation. It's usually, like I said in the beginning, people rarely come in here and say, I want you to treat my rheumatoid arthritis. They come in and say, I have fibromyalgia, or I have peripheral neuropathy, or I have chronic fatigue, or I have something. I have irritable bowel syndrome, and then as you're looking, they have circled rheumatoid arthritis and and in generally it's going to improve and and i would argue that the process can be stopped maybe even reversed a little bit and then the immune system through dietary recommendations and through maybe some supplemental report most of, most of you 
if you have rheumatoid arthritis in Washington, most of you are very low in vitamin D. That's another whole subject. Um, we don't see it as the cause. We kind of see it as the effect. And, awesome. um, and, and so you might be taking vitamin D, which is, a, which is, I think, a little bit better trade-off of taking some abuse from your relatives and, and from the waiters for, for you being on the stupid diet than maybe having to take these um, anti-rheumatic drugs for the rest of your life. Uh, it's, it's a lifestyle change, but it works. Mm -hmm. So, so that's it. I think we cover it. I think we covered anything it. else. No, nope. okay. I said what I needed to say. So we need to say what we didn't say last week, which was oh, okay. Facebook or right. So if you need more information, we pause there for about five seconds. Cause we used to say, if you have questions, however, the questions from across the world, became too much. <laughs> and so we can't do that anymore. So if you need more information, if you want to contact us, if you're curious about your condition, again, this is information. There's no pressure. But if you want to contact us, you can go to our Facebook page. You can go to powerhealthtalk.com and you can get more information there. And I think that pretty well covers it. Yeah. So we'll see you next week with another currently we're going through autoimmune problems. So we'll see you next week with another autoimmune problem and how we specifically address that one, whatever it's going to be. All right. See you next week. Thank you.